Good morning, Every Nation Taipei. Welcome to Church Online. Yo, good morning, Every Nation Taipei. Hi, welcome to Every Nation Church. Good morning, morning church. church. Welcome, welcome to, to Every, Every Nation, Nation Taipei. Taipei. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Sunday Service Online. Hi, guys. Welcome to Church Online. I actually live in China, but it doesn't matter where you are because the service is online. So let's enjoy our service. Hi everyone, my name is Darren and I'm part of the leadership team here at Every Nation Taipei. I want to welcome you to your online service. We're so glad that you're choosing to worship with us today. I know that we probably all prefer to see each other physically rather than online. And that's why we can't emphasize enough the importance of staying connected with each other during this time. We have small groups during the week, and also right after this service, we have a connect hour. It's a virtual space to meet others, play some games, and just hang out. I really enjoyed catching up with my friends each week like that. I'll be there again this time, so join us, and please don't be a stranger. If you want information on how to join or about small groups, you can go to our website at everynationtaipei.com or you can add us online. The ID is at everynationtaipei. Also, today we have a special speaker, Pastor Scott Dalma from Ian Yokohama, our sister church in Japan. He'll be sharing the word with us today, and I'm really looking forward to that. Now, let's ready our hearts for worship. I recently read Psalm 57, where David said, My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. You know, it's interesting because if you look at the rest of this psalm, you see that David was actually running away from Saul. His life was in danger. I believe worship can be a formative experience for us. We may not feel the words that we are singing at the moment, but they form our hearts to believe rightly about God. That's why it's even more powerful when we worship from a difficult, difficult place. That's my encouragement for us as we enter into worship. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you that we can come together to worship you as one body even if we're not physically in the same place. God, we thank you because you're always with us. You're so faithful and so committed to us, God. Um, you're always with us, even in our most difficult times. Lord, I pray that as we worship today, um, that you will form our hearts to believe your promises, to trust you, and to surrender all of ourselves to you, God. We all pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
What a powerful song and an even more powerful truth that Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice and we can put our hope in him. Jesus is the sacrifice that we can trust because he alone died for our sins and he is our assurance that our sins are forgiven. No matter what you've done, you can come to God and he's the, the promise that we can be reconciled with God who better than the man who was fully God and fully man to reconcile God and man back together again. That we can have the presence of God in our everyday life here and know that we will be in the presence of God throughout all of eternity. This is what Jesus Christ has done for us. And this is why He is our hope of salvation. For those of you who today who are maybe struggling, losing hope, maybe you don't sense God's presence in your life, I want to pray with you that you would have that sense of God's presence with you.
that you would have that renewed hope that God will always see you through and that you and I, we have an assured, uh, assured eternity with God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the gift of Jesus, the perfect sacrifice who gave himself for us so that we could live with you and uh, for all of eternity as well as here on this earth. God, I pray for those right now who feel like your presence is gone, who, who don't sense you with them, whose maybe their hope is beginning to, to wane. Uh, Father God, I pray that you would come alongside them, that you would carry them through the times of their difficulties, the times when they're losing hope, Lord God, that you would renew that hope, that you would strengthen their faith, that, Lord God, your Holy Spirit would make himself real to them, that they would be aware of your presence, walking with them through their dark times. Father God, I pray for a fresh wind of strength, fresh wind of faith and hope to come to them even now in jesus name we pray amen amen well we're going to continue with our worship uh, with our time of giving and to start with i want to give you just simple instructions on how to give uh, first of all you can go to our website everynationtaipei.com and there are simple instructions there on how to give or you can go to our line account at every nation taipei and, uh, and you can also find simple instructions there, clear instructions on how to give. I like when things are clear and simple. And you know, that's how God intended us to live. That's why he gives us a few simple and clear instructions in his word that we can always go back to in every situation. One of them, one of the main ones that I live by is his great commandment, the first commandment, to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. The Bible says when we do this, if we, do, if we focus on getting that right, we'll get everything else right. And so loving God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we need to bring that into a practical way. How, how do we practically love God? And this is what helps me. I think about my time. Am I putting God first with my time? In other words, when I wake up in the morning, do I give Him my first thoughts and my first moments? Do I spend my first moments with Him? Throughout my day, am I honoring Him? I think about my actions and think, is the way that I'm acting, is it, is it uh, communicating a love for God? And does it express a love for people? Do I serve others, whether I'm with friends or at work or at school? Do I behave in a way that communicates a love for God and a love for people? Does it inspire people to love God? And then with my finances? Am I putting God first with my finances? Do I give Him the first of whatever, com whatever comes to me? Do I uh, direct the rest of my finances in a way that honors Him? And so as we give to God in this moment, let's honor God. Let's put Him first with our finances. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank You for the many blessings You bring to our lives. And especially right now, we thank you for the gift of, of finances that you give to us, Lord. You are the one who gives us the ability to bring in wealth, to make money. And God, I pray that with the monies that come to us, we would always honor you and put you first. That we would spend our monies in a way that communicates our love for you and our love for others. And Father, everything that we give to you, I pray that you would take these offerings and you would multiply them for the use of your kingdom that others would come to know your love. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's always fun to get together online. I wish we were in person, but I'm glad that we can even uh, online, technology makes it possible for us to still connect, even when we're phys physically distanced uh, and geographically maybe isolated. And today um, we have a, a special testimony from a Zoom call that I want to share with you. I hope this encourages you, and I hope it encourages you uh, to reach out to someone else. Use your technology, whether a video chat or an audio call or a text message. Use technology to encourage others and to share the love of God. So here is a Zoom call that we want to share with you. I hope it encourages you. 
Well, I'm excited today because we have one of our wonderful members, Gina, who's going to share an encouraging story with you today. You know, when we share our testimonies with each other, there is this divine encouragement that comes. And so, Gina, thanks for sharing your testimony today. Would you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Gina. I am a student from Thailand. Currently, I'm studying clinical psychology at National Donghua University here in Taiwan. I understand that you're going to share a story about being bullied. So how did this bullying start? It started at the very beginning of my first semester here since September last year. That was one group of Thai students who wanted me to join the protest with them, but I refused. So after that, they did not leave me in peace at all. So what did this group of students do to you? They aggressively insulted me, both in person and through text messages. They even blocked my way at the convenience store. During that period, I was participating in a contest. Just the night before my competition, they told me that they would do anything just to make sure that I could not appear on the stage. Honestly, I was scared the whole night. And even worse than that was that was one evening they kicked me out of the common kitchen in front of many people. It was so embarrassing and beyond that it was hurtful. So how did you respond to this? Sincerely, I cried. I avoided encountering them as much as I could. I talked to my friend who introduced me to Christ and she helped connected me with the Ren to help me find a Christian community. And lucky me, I become part of the Every Nation Taipei family. A lot of you here have helped to pray for a better situation for me, and I'm really grateful for that. So Gina, what happened at the prayer meeting? It was on Friday, the 4th of June, I asked the group to pray for me to have a forgiving heart so I can handle whatever they will bully me next. I prayed without knowing that the battle was about to end exactly that night. Oh, that's great. Oh, well, what happened after praying? Well, right after the prayer meeting, I went out for dinner and on my way back, I coincidentally met them. They walked straight to me they came to apologize and asked me to forgive them. It was so real. It was so real. I feel so relieved. After almost one year of suffering, finally peace has begun. And can you believe it? Up until now, they keep sending me gifts and flowers just to show that they're really sorry. Wow, praise God. That's amazing. So what did you do after this answered prayer? What did that teach you? There are three important things I've learned throughout this experience. First is prayer alone is powerful. Prayer with the community is most powerful. For the Lord himself said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in the midst of them. Matthew 18, 20. Mm -hmm. Second, I learned trust, that we can trust God for all of our needs and our desires. Lastly is forgiveness. I realize that I am powerless to forgive unless I have God's strength. So I keep asking God to give me strength to be able to fully forgive them because it was not easy to just forgive everything they've done in just a second. It was more like a process that I gradually released the bitterness that was in my heart. 
Those are such great, really powerful lessons. What would you want to share with other people who are maybe struggling with prayer? To everyone who's listening to this, whatever you are going through in life, please keep praying. Because maybe the miracle that you've been waiting for is just a prayer away. The power of prayer is, is truly the power of God who's got it all in control. With prayers, all things are possible. So keep on hoping and keep on praying. That's a powerful story, Gina. Thanks so much for sharing that with us today. You know, I'm sure that as you're sharing right now, there are people who are listening who are struggling. And so would you join with me for a moment? We just want to pray for those who are right now struggling. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the power of prayer that connects us with you. And Father, you know each one out there today who at this moment right now are struggling in their lives, struggling with anxiety, struggling with bullying themselves, or uh, struggling with any other kind of a crisis or problem that they might be facing. Lord, we thank you that you say that whenever we have anxieties or cares or worries, we can bring them to you in the place of prayer and that you care for us and will answer So, Father, we pray on their behalf, would you visit them with that the Holy Spirit of comfort come, strengthen them, bring them peace, Lord God, and intervene in their situation. Thank you now, Lord God, for being a God who not only hears our prayers, but who responds. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks again, Gina, for being with us today. Well, I am super excited for today because I have the opportunity to introduce you to one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, Pastor Scott Dauma, who I've been friends with since 1971, 50 years ago, when he walked into our little church in Guam. I think he was wearing his flip-flops and and I think they were actually mismatched (laughs) from two different pairs. And here's this young teenager came into church. Of course, I was younger than he was, Uh, but who knew that 50 years later, we'd be ministering together. In fact, I remember this week, this week is a special moment uh, in our relationship because we flew to Japan together and it was the beginning of his ministry in Japan and my first mission trip. And we left uh, Hawaii on July 29th and arrived in Japan on July 31st. In between, we missed my birthday, July 30th, but we celebrated in the air. That was a really special uh, birthday. Uh, celebrating with the team there. Someone brought a cake. That was fun. But you know, our ministry goes goes way back these 40 years. And I I think back over the ups and downs because when Scott first started that ministry uh, in Japan, it was tough, tough to reach people in the language that he was just learning. And I can remember when he started his church and planted it and how they're just a handful of people and what a struggle it was to see people come to Christ. But to see where it is today, where he's reached hundreds of Japanese people. He's got hundreds of young Japanese uh, professionals and students who've come to Christ and who are part of his church and who are being raised up as leaders now in the church and to see the churches now that he oversees in Japan. In fact, Scott is the overseer uh, for all of East Asia, for every nation. He oversees Taipei. So, So he really is like a spiritual father to this church, to our house here. And, uh, and he's my overseer, and, and I go to him for counsel at times. And so I'm excited for, for you to be able to have him minister to you today. Scott is a, a man who lives the word, and you're going to be blessed by both his strong faith, but also his great love. And so, Pastor Scott, we are so excited to receive your practical wisdom today. Let's listen to Pastor Scott. Hello to everybody in Taipei. What a joy it is to come bring the word to you today. I bring you greetings from my wife, Naomi, and from my children, Sarah, who is married and has two children. They'd work with us here, Sarah and Skek, and my second daughter, uh, Irene, who's married and and is, in fact, is working with our Every Nation Church in Singapore. And we bring you greetings from all of our churches here in Japan and from our churches all over East Asia which uh, we work together with. You know, today is a very special day to me, especially because um, on the 29th of this month, 
is a very important day. Do you know what day that is? It's Pastor Bruce's birthday. And this year uh, is very, very special because uh, real, in reality, Bruce and I, when I first became a missionary, we came to Japan. He came with me. And uh, it was 40 years ago this January, or this July 29. So I was hoping Bruce and Terry could come and we could have a big party here and to remember that, but we'll do it through this message. And so I, I feel it's very kind of prophetic that I can be speaking to the, the church that Pastor Bruce is in right now and, and how delighted we are that Bruce and Terry are back in Asia and working with us over in this part of the world. So it's a joy to be with you all, and we are truly, truly family. You're a faithful group of people, and I know this coronavirus has kind of made our heads spin around a little bit, but God's in control, and great things are going to happen. When we get through this, we're going to be surprised what fantastic things God has done. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that you would teach us from it, and that it would have a powerful and impactful uh, flow in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me just read a scripture to you, and it will come into context much later as I, as I talk through the message here. It says, Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is the words of the Apostle Peter. And he says here, he's encouraging these people in, in, that are going through great persecution. He says, you know, I know you're suffering, but you're suffering according to God's will. Entrust your soul to Him, because He is the faithful Creator, and He will take care of you. Anyhow, why am I saying that? Well, um, for the last several months, I've been studying through the book of Acts, and felt to share that with you today. When you study the book of Acts, of course, it's a book of miracles, 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 right? From Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit falls on everybody, you know, they lay hands on the sick and they get better. Um, you know, later on, we'd get into the later stories. We see Peter, remember, he comes to a man, his name's Aeneas, who was, he was a cripple. And he comes to the man and he says, Aeneas, in Christ, Jesus the Christ heals you. And that guy gets up, picks up his bed and goes home. It's just like Jesus. And then right there in the next sentence, it says that, that this, this wonderful, holy, godly woman named Dorcas, the other name is Tabitha, has died. And so they bring Peter into her, her room and he goes in there and he says, Tabitha, arise. And this dead woman comes back to life. So the, I mean, the book is full of miracles. You study of Peter, Peter then, right, he sees the angels come and talk to him. And he sees the Holy Ghost come and fall upon the Gentiles. And miracles and miracles and miracles and miracles. And that brings us to Acts chapter 12. And that's where I want to get to today. And in Acts chapter 12, uh, the, the, the phrase starts this way. It says, about that time. About that time. Now, let me just stop here a minute. I believe in miracles. I have literally seen cancer disappear in an instant. I have seen broken homes come back together totally miraculous. I've seen provision from God. Uh, just no way could people provide that way. But God provided. Breakthroughs, and fantastic things. Wonderful things. But you know, sometimes I've seen the opposite. Sometimes people get healed, and sometimes they die. And that puts us into a quandary. Sometimes it seems like everything's provided, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it seems like the family is being healed, and sometimes it feels like the family's getting worse and worse. And the reality is we live kind of in a quandary. We live in... Sometimes we like to use the term, we live in the, the gap of not understanding. And so about that time, we'll go back to chapter 12. Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. About that time. 
All these wonderful things are happening. And about that time, violent hands are laid on James, and he's killed with the sword. Now, this is a very short phrase, and it's very easy to pass over. And I have often passed over it quickly to go jump into the next part of the story, which is the miraculous salvation of Peter from the prison. But I want us to stop here a minute and just contemplate this. This is a very hard thing to understand. This is talking about James. Now, who is James? Now, if you read your Bible in the New Testament, it's a little confusing because there seems to be so many Jameses. This James is the one that we should remember because there was Peter, there was James, there was John. He was one of the big three. He was kind of like, if, if you were starting an organization, he was number one, number two, He's number two on the list, Peter, James, and then John. And so he was there from the very beginning. He saw Jesus walk on the water. He was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there probably, you know, um, through most of the miracles that you read about in the, in the gospel. He was a witness. He was there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Of course, he was there in the upper room when Jesus came back. He was a witness to the resurrection. He was a very, very important key member of this early church. And he was arrested, and it says that he was killed. He was killed with a sword. One short phrase. Doesn't talk about him having a trial. Doesn't give him a whole chapter like Stephen had earlier, right? Where Stephen gets to give his whole speech and this fantastic martyrdom. No, it just says very simply, and he was killed with a sword. So when I read the Bible about that, I, I just stop for a minute and I wonder, what did those early believers feel like? You know, this must have been a very sad thing because they were very, very close, right? And it must have been very fearful because they realized if they're going to kill James, they can kill any of us. But more so, it must have been very confusion. God... You're the God who's supposed to take care of us, especially James. Didn't you just raise that dead, good woman from the dead? Didn't you do that, God? Why couldn't you save James? And so there's this great fear. There's a great confusion because this one key leader of the church has been taken away. And I want you to kind of feel that gap. Because I think in our lives, we have that a lot. I know I feel that a lot. I think, God, why didn't you do this? And why didn't you do that? And that big question mark is always coming. Why? 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 And I think as Christians, if we're honest and put it out there, our God is good enough to maybe help us to get through that and to understand. Miracles happen. Sometimes you die. Hmm? Let's continue on. So the story then goes and talks about another fella whose name is Herod. And Herod was the king. Now in any good story, there's always a bad guy. And the Bible is full of bad guys, right? Right at the very beginning, you have Adam and Eve and you have the serpent, right? So there's the battle between Adam and Eve and the devil. You have the Israelites and when they're Moses and they, their, their enemy is, is Pharaoh because they have to overcome Pharaoh. David had his Goliath. And the early believers had this man whose name was Herod. Now, Herod, uh, he's also confusing because you have so many Jameses in the Bible. But this Herod is, is not the same Herod that, uh, you know, tried to kill all the babies when Jesus was, was born. In fact, this is not the Herod that Jesus even stood before uh, prior to his, or his crucifixion. This is another Herod. And uh, this Herod... Was, was very political. And he was, he, he was actually, he was loved by the Jewish people because he was very good to the Jewish people. And so he realized that the Jewish people didn't like these new Christians. And so to win more of the Jewish people's political favor, he had arrested James and killed James and he saw that it made everybody happy. And so now he arrested Peter. And he's going to do the same thing. But I want you to see something before we ever get to uh, move on with the story. God always wins. 
You need to say that with me. God always wins. Even though James dies, God is still going to win. Amen? Let's look at the story. Herod has arrested this fella who is our hero, whose name is Peter. Here, I'll put it up here. God always wins, okay? Peter. He arrests Peter. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to uh, arrest Peter also. And this was during the days of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, right? And then he goes on in chapter 4, or, or, or verse 4, he says, And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but the earnest prayers for him was made to God by the church. Now, when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. So think of this with, for me with a moment, okay? Peter is arrested. And how, how do you think Peter felt? Peter never expected to get out of that prison. He had 16 men guarding him, right? And it said that he was chained between two of them. And in reality, his um, future didn't look very good. It looked like pretty much my life is going to end up just like James. So what does he do? And I think this is something that I, I, we can all learn from. Maybe some of you are already practicing this. What does he do? He, he, he sleeps. <laughs> Some of you may be sleeping through this message. I don't know. But I hope you're not. He falls asleep. The story shows us that he's sleeping between probably these two stinky soldiers. He's got chains on his arms. And what is, what is for sure is tomorrow he most likely will die, yet he is very, very deep sleep. He's not anxious. In fact, he is in great peace. And he is yielded to God. Now, now, let's remember Peter. Peter is the guy, remember? He's the one who denied Jesus three times. He's the guy who, when he heard the, the, the rooster crow on the, the night of the crucifixion, you remember, it just broke his heart and he went out and wept and wept and wept. But he's also the Peter that Jesus revealed himself to after the resurrection. He's the Peter that God said, or Jesus said to him, go and feed my sheep, love my sheep, take care of my lambs. He, he resurrected this dead Peter just like his own body had been resurrected. And on the day of Pentecost, this man so changed because of the encounter with the resurrected Jesus Christ, he's the one who gets up and preaches the very first Pentecost message, right? So because Peter had met the resurrected Jesus, this faith was no longer just an intellectual dream. It was a reality to him. And so for him, to live is great, to die is great, doesn't matter. My hand is in God's hands. And therefore, he could sleep. And why could I say that? Because later on, when Peter is an older man, and he writes a letter to these early Christians who were going through humongous persecution, he said this, which we started off our message. He said, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Entrust your soul to the faithful creator. That's who Peter was. He had come to the point where he could really, really trust God. He knew that whether he lived or whether he died, God was in control, was totally trustworthy, and so he was able to put his hand, put his very soul, his very being into the hands of God. And what did he do? Well, he slept. He slept, and there's a picture of just total, total trust. And that's what I really get from this story, that this guy, Peter, he trusted God. 
And I can only assume that the other man who's died by the sword had that same trust in God. But Peter slept. And while he's sleeping, the story goes on and an angel comes, stands next to him. This guy's sleeping so soundly that the light of the glory of an angel comes and shines in that room and it doesn't wake him up. And Peter, he has to be hit on the side, right? The guy whacks him. And he says, get up quickly. And then the chains fell off his hand. And the angel said to him, he had to do it like, like a little kid that's just been waking up before going to school. He says, dress yourself, put on your sandals. And I can just imagine, you know, this kind of sleepy headed Peter saying, okay, he puts them on, put your cloak around you, follow me. And he goes out and he follows him. And he did not know what he was, what was being done by the angel or whether this angel was real, but thought, he, he just thought he was seeing a vision. And eventually he gets led out of the prison and he comes to a place and he says, wow. He kind of comes and he wakes up finally. He says, now I am sure that God has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. My goodness. This guy has experienced this fantastic miracle, but it took him quite a while before he even woke up and said, hey, I'm free. Now I finally figured it out. He was so yielded to God that it didn't kick him right away. He wasn't walking in this anxiety and this fear and this nervousness. He was so yielded to God that when, the, when he really finally was set free, it, it took him a while just to even believe it himself. So... Peter lived. Amen. This is a great story. That's the one we usually tell, right? But let's not forget how the story started. James died. But both were living in the will of God. Right? James died. Peter lived. God is in control. Put this aside a minute. Let's just be honest, okay? Let's take an honest look at the whole Bible story. When our prayers are not answered, we may be confused. We may feel rejected. We might even feel anger, right, at God. Especially when we're asking for good things and honorable things and we're doing the right thing. You know, we, 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 we say, man, Dorcas was good. Look what God did. Dorcas came back to life. But the other side of the story is, James was good, but James never came back. Wasn't he important to God? And if we just sit back and be honest, come on, let's be really honest. Sometimes we just don't understand. And this is a theme through the Bible. You know, we, we, we look at our heroes, right? We look at Abraham. And when God promised Abraham, he said, took him outside, said, Abraham, see all the stars in the sky? Look at the sand. That's how many children you're going to have, Abraham. And when Abraham died, he was still a nomad. He didn't have his own country yet. He was still a traveler. And he only had one son named Isaac. Right? It didn't happen yet. Not only do we think of Abraham, we think of the whole nation of Israel. Israel Finally, they become a group of people. They grow and grow and grow, but then they end up in Egypt. Remember the story? And they all become slaves. And the Bible says that they were slaves for 430 years. Not four years. 430 years. Fathers were slaves. And when they died, they basically, all they could leave their children was the chains that they had. And those children could only leave those chains to their next, uh, the, the, the ones who followed after them. 430 years and still nothing had happened for them. The Bible's full of people like that, right? You think of David. David, in his younger days, he, he has to run away from Saul. He has to battle Goliath. I mean, he's battling all these things. His life is not, up, is not just up and down. It's mostly down. In the end, hallelujah, things get great. But even then, his own son tries to kill him. And so that's why when you read his Psalms, 
he says things like this. He says, awake, O Lord. I mean, he's praying kind of my prayer, right? Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Don't reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery? Why do you forget our oppression? That was his song. We, we usually don't sing that song much in our church. Do you guys sing that song? Here's another one. This is one of his greatest hits. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so, so far from me? Why are you so far from helping me? Where are you, God? Those words are familiar. Why? Because those are the words of Jesus himself. When Jesus is on the cross, he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so if David prays that, and Jesus even felt that, I think it's okay sometimes when we feel that way. And we got to get it out to God. We got to say it to God. God, what's going on? And it's okay to be that way. It's okay to be honest with God. See, what happens to us sometimes is, is, is we can become stuck. And we just live in this, why, why, why? Just always looking for reasons. And if we just keep looking for all the time and trying to find all the answers all the time, the reality is you're not going to find them. You're just going to get yourself into a rut and you're going to waste your life and you're going to spend your whole life just walking and question, 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 question. But I want you to understand this, that even in the midst of your why, even in the midst of your deepest, deepest, I don't understand moments, if you open up to God, you might not get the answer yet, but you will get, it's okay. I will understand one day type of answer from God. You catch what I'm saying? This is what I'm praying for all of us today. Sometimes you get better, sometimes you don't. God's in control. I don't have to understand everything. It's okay. And then we can move on with our lives. Now, I want to bring this more to me and to you. Because I, I'm a more of a practitioner. And I, and I know you must be too, because you're, you're, you're believers who don't live uh, in a monastery. You have to go to work tomorrow morning. And go to school. You have to be with your families. And we have to live in this gap. We have to live in this, I don't understand everything. But we have to live with an understanding of this, that God is in total control. Amen. So then how should we live? And see, I battled this for years. And I would just like to give to you some advice of how did I overcome this gap, this quandary, this question? And one of the big stories that really helped me was um, John the Baptist. You know, this is a different John <laughs> than the Peter and John and James John. This is the first John, okay? I remember, there's lots of James, there's lots of Johns, there's lots of Herods, okay? There was this John, this is John the Baptist. And he, in, in this story, of course, he's put into prison. And just like James, he eventually is killed by the sword. He has his head chopped off. And in Luke's gospel, before, you know, he is, um, you know, um, put to death, he's in his cell, and he's thinking about Jesus, and he says, is Jesus really the Messiah? Is he really the one? Even though I saw the dove come down upon him and heard the voice from heaven said, this is my son who am I am greatly well pleased. You know, he's been hearing rumors. He's been wondering about Jesus. Is he the one that I gave my life for? Is he really the one? And so he sends his own disciples over to, to, to where Jesus is to find out. And they ask him, are you the one or should we, we should be waiting for someone else? And the Lord, you know, shows we did this miracle. We're doing these things. We did that things. But then he says one important thing. And this, this is the thing that really helped me as a young believer. When the word says, and blessed is the one who's not offended by me. Just think about that a minute. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. See, we can choose to be offended by God. But in doing that, we may walk away from the great thing that God is preparing for us 
and the future that he has for us. And Jesus says to all of us, don't be offended by me. Instead, what is he saying? Trust me, trust me, trust me. When you don't understand, you can choose to be offended. You can choose to be angry and walk away from God. But if you walk away from God because of your heart being offended, you will walk away from the miracle and the blessing that God has in store for you. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So how did I live this way? And I still battle it, of course, but how do I live? And I hope this helps you. Number one is my perspective. Our lives are part of God's big progress, our big, big, big process. We're part of his big story. See, I must never be overwhelmed by my present. Because no matter how much I'm in my present, there is also a past and there is also a future and the present is very small. What's important is what's going to happen in the future. We need perspective. We need to get above the whole situation and look down from God's point of view. In Hebrews chapter 11 is a verse which I truly love. It says, these all died in faith. These are the heroes of the faith. These are the guys who never saw the answers to their faith. But not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them, greeted them from afar. That even though it was a long way off and they never saw it, it says that they reached out their hands and they greeted the answer, even though it never happened in their lifetime. When I was a young missionary 40 years ago, and I came to Japan and then eventually came to the city of Yokohama, planted a church, and for years, nothing happened. And uh, I mean, I was depressed a great deal because I thought I'm wasting my life, nothing's happening. And then I remember after we'd been going for 10 years, people started to get saved. And the church began to grow. You know, it, it went from 10 people to 20 people to 100 people and it began to grow and grow. And, and, and it came to a point where, you know, I was just so happy we rented a bigger facility and everything was going good. And I remember one day, the church probably now is, is almost 15, 17 years old, and I'm walking out along our waterfront here in Yokohama. And as I'm walking there, I'm just thinking and praying, and, and the Lord spoke something to my heart. He says, and I think he was just trying to keep me uh, humble. He says, Scott, never forget, you are reaping seeds that you never sowed. And so I stopped there for a moment and I remembered because it was exactly the place where 150 years ago the first Protestant missionaries came to Japan. Our church was right there. And as I sat there and I thought, 150 years ago missionaries came here and some of them spent 20 years doing much more work. They were much more godly men than me and they never saw one convert in 20 years. And God spoke to me, you're reaping the seeds that they sowed. And that really helped me. Okay, I need to have a perspective of seeing behind me. Then he said something which really helped me a great deal for the rest of my life. He spoke to me, he says, but never forget that you are sowing seeds that you will never reap, but others will reap in the next generation. And that gave me a better picture from way up here, right? My present, uh, of course, I want a good present. But the present is what's so important. What's important is what's gone before, that I'm doing my part now, and that in the future, I'm helping prepare the way for those who will come after me. And when I got that picture of the perspective, it made all the difference. Can you see that? It helps you get through the, I don't understand what's going on type of, of thing, right? The second thing that always helped me was the understanding of the the sovereignty of God. You know, I came to a, con a conclusion that says, God is God. God is going to do what God wants to do. And if I want to succeed in life, I just need to cooperate with Him. God is God. God's going to do what He needs to do and wants to do. My goal is just cooperate. 
you know, I can remember just as a young college kid, Pastor Bruce would have may, may have been with me when this all happened. And <clears throat> this verse was taught to me. It says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And I began to realize, no way can I understand everything. I don't need to understand everything. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Your ways are way beyond my ways. Why don't I just trust you? That brings me back to Peter's words. Peter says, can I trust my soul to my faithful creator? He's been faithful in my life. He's never failed. Can I trust him? That's my prayer for all of us today. Can we trust our faithful creator? Well, Peter did. I believe James did. And what happened? Well, you can read through the rest of the story there in Acts chapter 12. It says, but the word of God increased, multiplied, and the church grew. Amen. God's will was done. My final thing that has helped me in my life is this simple phrase. This understanding that Peter must have had, and James must have had before he was killed. This simple phrase that says, I am with you always. That's what Jesus said to them, right? His last words, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. When they sat in their prison rooms, Jesus was with them. In their good times, Jesus was with them. But in their scary times, Jesus was with them. We were never created to live a life without this knowledge. We need to know that our Creator loves us and that we can entrust our lives to Him. Without Him, life will always be filled with fear and anxiety. Either you will have anxiety or you will live a life full of total denial and you will be deceived. I invite you to come to the one who created you. Give him the rights of your life. Put your life in his hands. And this great assurance of peace will be yours. He's with you. He is sovereign. And he sees the past and he knows the future. Therefore, I can trust him. Amen. Lord, I thank you that sometimes we're healed and sometimes we're not. Sometimes the answer is yes, but sometimes the answer is no or wait. Sometimes it seems like you're not acting and moving, but the reality is behind everything you are and you are in control. And especially now in the midst of this pandemic, the question marks are all over the place. The why, why, why attitude is all around us. But Father, we come before you today and say, we will not go into the rut of why, 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 why. But we decide today to step out and say, even if I don't know why, even if I don't know the answer, I know the one who has the answer and is the answer. So, Father, I pray that through this message today that we would trust you and we would depend on you and we would yield everything to you. And I pray for those today who may not really know you yet, but that has been, they've been hearing this word, this honest word. Not just everything's going to be great, 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 but sometimes it's going to be hard, 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 hard. But in the midst of that, Jesus is there. Lord, their heart just burns right now because they're saying, that's what I want to believe. So let them believe. Come into their lives this day, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And you guys have a great, great rest of the summer. Thank you, Pastor Scott Dalma, for sharing such an amazing word. By the way, my name is Lori, and I have four questions for you guys that you can use for personal reflection or group discussion. One, how well do you handle with setbacks in life, like losing or failing? Two, 
Why do you think Peter was at peace while waiting to be put to death? Three, Pastor Scott gave us four practices that help him to trust God in hard times. Which of them is the most helpful to you? First, view life from an expanded perspective. Second, acknowledge the sovereignty of God. Third, entrust your soul to the faithful creator. And fourth, remember that God is always with us. And lastly, question number four, what steps can you take this week to help you or someone else to trust God rather than to be offended? We are actually a church that loves to pray. So we will invite you all to join our online prayer calls on Zoom happening on Wednesday at 8 a.m., Friday 7 p.m., and Sunday at 10.15 a.m., just before our online service. For more information on how to get the Zoom links, visit us in our website at everynationtaipei.com or message us through our line account at everynationtaipei. Feel free to send the prayer request to our line chat. We would love to pray, to stand with you for your prayer requests. It's so important to actually stay connected during this time with the challenges and restrictions, so we encourage you to join our Connect Hour. It's right after service. It will start at 12.30 at the Virtual Fellowship Hall on the Gather App. This is a place for us to chat, hang out, play games, and have great discussions on the Word and receive prayer. If you're actually new to online church, then this is a great way to get connected with our Every Nation family. For more details on our Connect Hour, check out our website at everynationtaipei.com. Actually, another way to stay connected and not miss our online services, simply subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can click on the bell icon to get reminders on our online services. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And please don't forget to add us on our official LINE account at Every Nation Taipei. Now, let me just say a prayer over us. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Father, for your word. Jesus, I want to ask you today, my Lord, that you're with everyone that is watching this moment, my Lord, that they will be able to feel your presence, that you will pour out your love to them, my Lord, where, wherever they are. And Father, I ask you that you will fill them with your peace, a peace, Father, that goes beyond, beyond everything on this earth. Thank you, Father, that you will give them your joy um, and that you, Father, will be with them through the week. And that with all the blessings that you give them, they will also be a blessing for others through the week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you guys for joining today and have a great week. See you next time, bye-bye.